Deep beneath the shimmering surface, a silent hunter waits. With a burst of speed unlike any land predator, sharks can turn a leisurely dive into a fight for survival. These magnificent creatures rule the ocean depths, and while attacks are rare, the consequences can be brutal. Join us as we explore the chilling true stories of those who faced the jaws of a shark and the desperate battles they fought to get back to the surface. Isla Mackenzie stared across the endless blue of the Indian Ocean. Sea spray glittered in the South African sun as their boat, the Ocean Drifter, bobbed rhythmically. It was the 12th of July, 2001, a day etched into Isla's memory forever. A veteran diver with countless hours exploring the world below, she was on assignment with her longtime partner, Jonah Van Dyke. Jonah was a bear of a man, his tanned face a roadmap of a life lived outdoors, a stark contrast to Isla's lean frame and sun-kissed freckles. They were a mismatched pair, yet their shared love for the ocean made them an unstoppable team. Today was no ordinary dive. They were off the coast of Gansbai, known as the significant white shark capital of the world. These magnificent but fearsome creatures were as mysterious as they were dangerous. Isla had a healthy respect for these animals. Despite years of experience, the thrill of being close to such raw power was undeniable. The morning had started like any other. In her well-worn wetsuit, Isla and Jonah wrestled the heavy steel cage into the water. Their observation pod allowed safe, close-up encounters with the sharks. The crew, buzzing with nervous excitement, baited the water with fish parts and oils, creating a slick to attract their star. As Isla slipped into the cage, she felt a familiar pang of anticipation mixed with caution. She checked her oxygen tank and regulator, and the rhythm of her breaths was a soothing mantra in the silence of the descent. Below, the world transformed. Gone was the sun-dappled surface. Here, all was deep blue and calm tranquility. Already submerged and keeping watch, Jonah signaled to her from outside the cage. With a final deep breath, Isla closed the hatch and sank into the heart of the shark's domain. It was a waiting game now. Great Whites were intelligent predators, patient and cunning. Years of study, they taught her about their acute senses of smell and sight. They could detect minute electrical currents emitted by living creatures. Jonah's missing leg was a constant reminder that nature played by its own rules down here. Isla loved her work, but never forgot the inherent danger. Time, they seemed to both crawl and race underwater. Shadows flickered in the periphery of Isla's vision. But the Great White remained elusive. Just as a numbing sense of routine began, a colossal shape materialized from the blue gloom. The shark was enormous, easily five meters long. Its skin was scarred, a testament to countless battles fought and won. It circled the cage slowly, its dark eyes seeming to fix on Isla with chilling intelligence. Something wasn't right. The shark's movements were erratic, unlike the calculated passes she was familiar with. And then it struck. With astonishing speed, the shark rammed the cage, the steel bars groaning and buckling under the impact. The force knocked Ayla off her feet, sending her tumbling. Desperately, she grabbed a handhold as another blow shuttered the cage. The shark was in a frenzy, a mindless machine of teeth and muscle. Panic threatened to consume Ayla. Yet beneath the terror, her diver training kicked in. She forced herself to breathe slowly to assess the situation. The cage, though dented, was holding. Her oxygen supply was intact, but for how long? The shark attacked again, this time targeting a corner of the cage. The bars bent with a screech, the gap between them widening alarmingly. Ela's heart pounded in her ears. The shark, sensing weakness, thrashed against the cage, its jaws wide open. Then with a sickening twist, a bar snapped. Metal shrieked as another followed suit. Saltwater rushed in as the shark lunged, its massive head thrusting through the widening gap. Ayla scrambled back, barely evading the snapping mass of teeth. This wasn't a curious nudge, this was an all-out attack. In a desperate move, she grabbed a spare tank, using it to wedge against the predator's snout. Simultaneously, she fumbled for the emergency release on the cage hatch. The shark thrashed, its rough scales scraping against her skin, its eye rolling wildly. With a final desperate shove, Ayla propelled herself out of the broken cage. The shark swiveled a blur of white and gray, narrowly missing her outstretched legs. She kicked frantically towards the surface and the image of the shark's open maw burned into her mind. When her lungs screamed for air, Ela gasped frantically through the waves. 
Strong hands hauled her roughly onto the boat deck. It was Jonah, his face a mask of strained fear. She could barely speak, only pointing feebly back towards the water. The crew acted quickly, winching the damaged cage out of the depths. It emerged twisted and shattered, a testament to the raw power of the ocean's apex predator. But the shark vanished back into the blue where it belonged. Isla sat trembling, her wetsuit ripped and bloodied. The aftermath was a blur of questions, medical checks, and concerned faces. Later, as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with streaks of orange and purple, Hila found herself alone on the deck, staring into the darkening water where her ordeal had unfolded. She had cheated death, but the experience had changed her. Once a familiar playground, the ocean now held a hint of menace. Images of the attack haunted her dreams. It would take time to heal, both physically and mentally. And though Isla would return to the sea she loved, she knew a sliver of innocence was lost forever in those steel-barred depths. Tyler James was a creature of the wind. His weather-beaten face and sun-bleached hair bore testament to countless hours spent chasing the perfect wave. Kiteboarding was his fix, a symphony of power and freedom that coursed through his veins. Today, the 22nd of March, 2003, was no different. He was miles offshore, chasing the gusts off the coast of Bahia, Brazil, a haven known for its vibrant waters and temperamental winds. Bahia was also infamous for another reason, its sharks. Bull sharks in particular thrived in the murky waters where rivers merged with the ocean. These aggressive predators were notorious for venturing into shallows, their stocky bodies perfectly designed for hunting near the coast. Tyler knew the risks, but the thrill always outweighed the fear. This morning began like any other. Tyler set out with his usual crew, a motley mix of locals and fellow adrenaline junkies. There was Enzo, a weathered sinewy fisherman with a comprehensive knowledge of the currents. Then there was Maya, a fiery surf instructor with a laugh that rivaled the crashing waves. Despite his solitary nature, Tyler found a sense of belonging amidst this band of thrill-seekers. He spent the early hours riding the swells, carving lines across the water's surface, his kite a colorful arc against the endless sky. The wind shifted as the afternoon wore on, carrying him further offshore than intended. A sense of unease prickled him. He was out of sight of land, a lone dot in the vast ocean. Below the surface, life teemed. Tyler knew these weren't the sleek, cautious sharks of deeper waters. These were territorial hunters. Warmer freshwater, abundant fish, and less competition made this stretch of coast a bull shark's ideal feeding ground. Still, years of instinct had made him complacent. He could outrun anything lurking below, couldn't he? The adrenaline was an addictive tonic, the danger half the appeal. He hoisted his kite, caught a powerful gust, and soared across the water. It was then he saw it, a dark shadow circling below him. At first he dismissed it as a dolphin or a large fish, but its size and distinctive shape sent a chill through him. A bull shark, unmistakably giant and patrolling its territory. He had become the prey. Tyler's heart slammed against his ribs. The shark circled closer, its pale underbelly flashing beneath the waves. He tried to keep calm, maneuvering his kite to outrun the predator. But the wind was fickle and the shark effortlessly kept pace, its movements unnervingly fluid. His hands tightened on the control bar. He had to return to the boat, but panic threatened to overtake him. He was miles from help, and the sun began its relentless descent. The thought of being stranded in the open ocean after dark sent him a fresh wave of terror. Desperation fueled a burst of speed. He yanked hard on the bar, cutting a sharp turn to throw the shark off. The bull shark, however, was relentless. It mirrored his turn, its dark eye seeming to fixate on him with chilling intensity. Any illusion of being at the top of the food chain was shattered. The time they were fractured into heart-stopping fragments. His board skimmed the surface and suddenly a monstrous shape shot upwards, breaching the water. Jaws clamped onto Tyler's lower leg, the force of the impact knocking him off the board. Icy water engulfed him as the shark thrashed its teeth tearing into his flesh. Pain ripped through him but adrenaline masked its full intensity. Instinctively he fought back. He kicked and flailed his arms to dislodge the predator's grip. Somehow, miraculously, the shark released him, leaving behind a mangled mess where his calf used to be. 
He was a ragged, bleeding doll in the grip of the unforgiving ocean. He surfaced, choking back seawater and screaming. The shark lingered ominously close, circling him like a vulture. It was only a matter of time before it attacked again. He scrambled back onto his board, a pathetically small island in the swirling water. His ruined leg throbbed in relentless agony. Blood stained the water around him, a gruesome invitation to the predator lurking just below. Thankfully, his kite was still attached, but the wind had dwindled, leaving him bobbing helplessly. He scanned the distant horizon, praying for the sight of a boat, anything to break the maddening solitude. Nothing. The shark nudged his board experimentally. He kicked out instinctively, his movements weak against the surging nausea. Then the creature struck again, not for his leg, but for the board itself, clamping down in a frenzy of splintering wood and foam. The kite jerked upwards, dragging him sickeningly through the water before the line snapped. Adrift, defenseless, he watched his shattered board disappear into the depths. Hope bled out alongside his lifeblood, painting the darkening waves. The sun was dipping below the horizon, plunging the world into twilight. The shark wouldn't wait until night fell completely. The end should have come quickly. The shark kept him waiting, circling and bumping his body. Tyler was barely awake, his ruined leg burning with pain. He saw blurry shapes and the vast ocean felt ready to take him. But a miracle happened. A small dot appeared on the horizon. A boat. His cries were weak, but the ship grew more prominent, the sound of its engine getting louder. Enzo was driving, his face filled with surprise and worry. They pulled Tyler onto the boat, rough hands quickly making a bandage to stop the bleeding. Maya covered him with a blanket, trying to calm him down. The ride back was filled with pain and quiet words of support. The shore seemed forever away, but they finally reached it. An ambulance was waiting, its siren screaming. He was taken to the hospital. They cleaned the horrible wound and sewed it shut. This would leave a terrible scar, reminding him of the shark. He spent weeks in the hospital having operations, his body covered in more angry scars. The doctors fought infection and he was always in pain. It took forever to get better. He had to learn to walk again. Bad dreams woke him up at night and the ocean was scary. He didn't think he could ever kiteboard again. The scars went deep. He kept to himself, the energy he used to have now gone. But he was alive. His body and spirit were hurt, but he lived. One day he could be brave enough to return to the ocean. But right now, it was enough to have survived. Violet Everwood wasn't just comfortable in the water. It was her natural habitat. She had grown up on the sandy shores of Queensland, Australia, where the rhythmic crash of waves was a constant soundtrack to her life. As a marine researcher, she spends more time beneath the surface than above it. It was the 15th of October, 2005, another field research day. Their study site lay in the heart of the Great Barrier Reef, a kaleidoscope of colors and teeming life. Violet focused on coral health and the effects of warming waters on these fragile ecosystems. While idyllic, the reef held inherent dangers. Tiger sharks were common, sleek, powerful predators that patrolled the deeper channels between the coral formations. This morning, she was working alongside her partner, Benji Ito. Benji, a seasoned dive master with Hawaiian roots, had an almost supernatural ability to read the ocean's moods. The son of a fisherman, he balanced scientific curiosity with a deep-rooted respect for the unpredictable nature of the sea. Her day began as usual, the clumsy donning of wetsuits and the careful calibration of monitoring equipment. The water, as always, was a delicious shock cool and refreshing against her sun-baked skin. Benji signaled the all-clear and she submerged, the familiar weightlessness washing over her. Beneath the surface, the world transformed. Vivid corals shimmered, fish darted in dazzling schools, and the sandy bottom rippled in the currents. It was peaceful and exhilarating, a fragile ecosystem she desperately wanted to protect. Violet lost track of time as she measured coral growth, took water samples and recorded her observations on a waterproof slate. She worked slowly, methodically, her rhythm in sync with the swaying corals. The Great Barrier Reef spanned thousands of kilometers, an intricate web of life. Tiger sharks, known for their indiscriminate appetites, were a vital link in the chain. They called the weak and the sick, keeping the reef's delicate balance intact. Violet knew this in theory, but an undercurrent of unease always accompanied her dives. 
It was a primal instinct, human versus top predator. And the ocean, for all its beauty, was a wild, untamed place. It began as a flicker in her peripheral vision. A large shadow moving too fast to be a fish. Violet's heart clenched. A tiger shark, unmistakably sleek even at a distance. She knew better than to panic. Slow, controlled movements were vital. Signaling to Benji was out of the question. It would only agitate the shark. She began a cautious retreat, aiming back towards the boat moored away. But the shark was curious. It circled closer, its pale underbelly almost luminous in the filtered sunlight. Violet had seen these stripes in videos and identification charts before. They belonged to a vast and aggressive female. It was almost hypnotic, this deadly ballet played in turquoise water. Her breath hissed through her regulator, each exhalation a plume of nervous bubbles. The shark closed the distance with alarming speed. It nudged her tentatively like a cat testing a new toy. Then, with a flick of its powerful tail, it lunged. Violet twisted, narrowly avoiding the first pass, but the shark wheeled back around. Now the circling was tighter, faster. Its mouth gaped, displaying a horrifying array of serrated teeth. She instinctively used her slate as a makeshift shield, a flimsy barrier against this force of nature. The shark rammed her again, the impact sending her tumbling backward. She lost her grip on the slate, watching it sink into the depths. Her dive knife was secured on her leg, a last line of defense. Somehow she needed to get back to Benji, back to the relative safety of the boat. She kicked out a desperate bid toward the surface. The shark followed, its movements sinuous but relentless. Just when she began to despair, a dark shape shot towards them. Benji. He was wielding a long dive pole, yelling and splashing the water to distract the shark. The ploy worked just long enough. The predator, momentarily confused, veered away. Violet used the precious seconds swimming with everything she had, scrambling upwards towards the sunlight, dappling the surface. Pain exploded in her leg as the shark, recovering quickly, clamped down. It wasn't a clean, severing bite, more a ragged tear as she wrenched herself free. She surfaced, gasping and terrified. Benji's strong arms pulled her into the boat in one swift motion. Crimson bloomed in the water, attracting the shark like a beacon. Benji moved with urgent precision. He ripped a strip off his shirt and fashioned a crude tourniquet on her thigh. His voice was a soothing counterpoint to the chaos in her mind. They sped back to shore, the boat slapping relentlessly against the waves. Violet's memory of the rest is fragmented. The blinding pain, the faces of concerned strangers on the beach, the sterile whiteness of the hospital. She had surgery received countless stitches and battled a persistent infection. The scar on her leg was twisted and ugly, a permanent testament to the predator that lurked below the waves. Recovery was both physical and mental. Once her sanctuary, the ocean now echoed those razor-sharp teeth. Her nightmares were a chilling replay of the attack, waking her in a cold sweat. Yet the pull of the sea was undeniable. Weeks turned into months and slowly a stubborn resolve took root. The attack was a terrifying outlier, a statistical anomaly. She couldn't deny her life's work out of fear. She would go back into the water, more cautious this time, more respectful. But she would go back. Eli Carter lived for the rush. Surfing wasn't just his sport, it was his identity. He craved the adrenaline, the dance with waves that could both propel and pulverize. Today, the 23rd of July, 2007, was a day he'd marked on his calendar for months. He was on a pilgrimage to the remote islands of French Polynesia, rumored to have some of the world's most challenging waves. Makatea, the island he chose, was a speck of volcanic rock and lush greenery in the vastness of the Pacific. It boasted untouched reefs that promised barreling waves and the solitude Eli craved. The local villages were small and quaint and the islanders eyed him with curiosity and wariness. They warned him of the currents, the winds, and most importantly, the sharks. Blacktip reef sharks, while smaller than their infamous cousins, were still predators to be respected. These waters teemed with fish, a buffet for sleek, hungry sharks patrolling the deeper channels. Eli brushed off the locals' concerns. He'd surfed with sharks before, part of the risk, part of the thrill. The sun beat down as he scanned the horizon, the anticipation buzzing through him. He was a skilled surfer, honed by years spent chasing waves on the wild coasts of California. 
Yet here, he felt like an outsider venturing into another creature's domain. The first few waves were exhilarating, robust tubes that spit him into the bright sunshine. But the ocean holds fickle energy today. The sets came irregularly and a strange current seemed to tug at him, pulling him further away from the known safety of the shoreline. He spotted a promising wave building far out, a monster wall of water. Eli turned and paddled with everything he had. He caught the wave just before it crested, dropping down its steep face, the thrill washing through him. But as he carved through the bottom turn, he saw them, a shiver of dark shapes below the surface. Not one, not two, but a whole pack of reef sharks, their sleek forms cutting through the clear water. His stomach clenched. This wasn't a casual encounter, this was their territory and he was the intruder. Panic threatened to choke him. The sharks circled below, growing bolder with each pass. His surfboard, once his tool for conquering waves, now felt like a flimsy barrier against this onslaught. Every instinct screamed at him to paddle back to shore, but the treacherous current kept him hopelessly within their reach. Survival mode kicked in. Eli knew that splashing and frantic movements would only incite the sharks. He forced himself to stay on his board, his body rigid with tension. The sharks came closer, bumping his board and testing its buoyancy. With each impact, he tensed, his vision prickling at the edges. Their numbers seemed to increase. He shouted, desperate to scare them off, but the endless waves and vast open sky swallowed his voice. His cries morphed into a choked sob. Was this how he was going to die, mauled and alone, miles from any help? One particularly bold shark lunged upwards. Eli instinctively kicked out, connecting solidly with its sleek body. The shark recoiled, but its retreat was momentary. It was encouraged. He had shown vulnerability. The pack surged forward, a flurry of snapping jaws and thrashing tails. His board was bucked violently and Eli was tossed into the churning water. He surfaced, spitting out salt water, the taste of fear metallic in his mouth. The sharks were upon him in seconds, a writhing mass of teeth and fins. Blindly, he struck out, landing a lucky blow on a snout. A wave crashed over them, momentarily separating him from his attackers. He clawed back onto his battered board, using the swell to his advantage. But the sharks were relentless. They quickly tore chunks off his board, forcing him further toward the unforgiving reef. A wave sent him tumbling again. His legs scraped against sharp coral, leaving a searing trail of pain. Blood blossomed in the water, a crimson invitation. He kicked at the sharks surrounding him, more out of desperation than any real hope of defense. His arms ached and his lungs burned. How much longer could he hold them off? Then a shape like an arrow shot through the water. It was a dolphin weaving through the sharks with astonishing speed and agility. Confused by this sudden interloper, the sharks scattered in momentary confusion. Seizing the opportunity, Eli began to swim, summoning every ounce of strength, his injured leg throbbing. The dolphin mirrored his path as if escorting him out of a battle zone. Behind him, he could see the sharks regrouping, their frenzy renewed. Yet somehow, inexplicably, he reached the shallows. The sharp coral gouged his skin, but he felt an agonizing safety. Collapsing onto the rough sand, he sobbed, the pain of his wounds secondary to the overwhelming shock. Alerted by the commotion, fishermen from the nearby village reached him soon after. Their arrival was miraculous. A small boat appeared as a speck amidst the vastness of the open water. Rough but kind hands pulled him from the shallows, grunting with the effort of lifting his dead weight. Back on shore, the villagers tended to his wounds with practiced ease. Strips of cloth became makeshift bandages. Herbal balms soothed his coral gashes, and whispered words offered a strange blend of comfort and awe. News of his ordeal spread like wildfire, and soon he was surrounded by faces etched with concern and disbelief. In broken English, they shared their stories of close encounters, friends lost, and respect offered to the powerful creatures that shared their island home. In the end, the ocean itself saved him. A dolphin, another ocean creature recognizing the unjustness of the attack. The villagers nodded. Such tales were part of their legends, of a deep unspoken alliance between the creatures of the sea. His return journey home was a blur. There were flights, hospitals, surgeries, an endless cycle of sterile rooms and sharp sterile pain. Recovery stretched into months. He bore the scars proudly, mangled marks on his leg and a jagged line on his arm, a testament to both his survival and the ocean's raw power. He learned to surf again, 
every paddle out a small act of defiance. The knowledge of the sharks was a constant companion, not fear exactly, but a bone-deep awareness. His carefree joy was tempered by caution, his once boundless playground now tinged with a hint of menace. Yet he returned to the waves because the ocean, despite its brutality, was in his blood. The thrill, the challenge, the dance with nature. It was a pull he couldn't and wouldn't deny. Stella Moreau was out of her element. Scuba diving had been a recent obsession, fueled by a desire to conquer her fears and a yearning for a world beyond her office cubicle. Today, the 11th of April, 2009, she stood on the swaying deck of a charter boat off the coast of Bimini in the Bahamas. These waters were famous for their shipwrecks and the creatures that inhabited them, especially hammerhead sharks. These odd-looking sharks held a strange fascination for Stella. With their wide-set eyes and distinctive head shape, they were unlike any other predator. They roamed the ocean as apex hunters, graceful and powerful reminders of nature's untamed energy. The rest of her dive group were seasoned veterans, laughing easily as they prepped their gear. Stella felt a pang of self-doubt. This was only her tenth open water dive, hardly enough to tackle a deteriorating shipwreck. Yet an undeniable thrill coursed through her. This felt less like a recreational activity and more like a test of courage. Her dive instructor, Anya, was a force to be reckoned with. With her no-nonsense attitude and weathered face, she'd seen it all in her decade-long dive career. Anya had an uncanny ability to sense Stella's nerves but tempered her stern guidance with a flicker of encouragement. The former cargo ship's wreck loomed out of the gloom as they descended. Algae clung to its metal carcass and schools of small, colorful fish darted in and out of its rusted openings. Stella tried to focus on the mesmerizing display of marine life around her but it was hard to shake the feeling of being watched. The wreck's interior was a labyrinth of narrow passages and decaying compartments. Navigating it required precise movements, a skill Stella struggled with. The darkness closed in on her, and the beams of their flashlights barely cut through the murky water. Hammerhead sharks were drawn to shipwrecks. These hollow structures offered both shelter and hunting grounds. Stella knew the dangers, but understood that most sharks were uninterested in humans. Her rapid breathing echoed strangely in the confines of her regulator. She fought back a rising sense of unease. The focus was crucial for survival. A flicker of movement caught Stella's eye. A massive shape materialized from the darkness. Its broad, flat head unmistakable. It was huge, the most giant hammerhead she had ever imagined. Its presence filled the cramped passage, dwarfing her in an instant. The shark circled her slowly, its eyes cold and unreadable. Time seemed to freeze as she was held captive by its unblinking gaze. Stella instinctively pressed herself against the wreck's hull. Her heart pounded like a drum in her chest. The shark inched closer, its hammer-like head swaying side to side as though surveying her from every angle. She knew that sudden movements would provoke an attack. It was purely curious now, but curiosity could turn deadly quickly. Then it lunged. Instinctively, she brought up her camera, using it as a barrier. The shark collided with her, knocking her roughly aside. Pain pierced her shoulder and her regulator was jostled loose, sputtering air into the water. She scrambled to reinsert it, but her air supply was dwindling dangerously. Anya's voice crackled over their shared communication channel, filled with urgency. Between panicked gasps, Stella conveyed her situation. The veteran diver's reply was clear, ascend immediately but slowly. Having tasted Stella, the shark wouldn't give up easily. She had to move fast but controlled. As she began her ascent, she realized with mounting horror that her movements were agitating the shark. It followed closely, repeatedly bumping her and snapping at her fins. Terror constricted her throat. She needed to reach the open water above the wreck, but the shark shadowed her relentlessly. Stella checked her air gauge. It was alarmingly low. With every passing second, her chance of survival decreased. Anya's instructions were a lifeline. Breathe calmly, ascend consistently, and don't panic. Stella focused on each exhale, desperately willing her burning lungs to obey. Finally, sunlight dappled the surface above, but the shark blocked her path like a terrible guardian. Anya, who had ventured back down, began yelling and banging a metal tank to distract the predator. For a heart-stopping moment, it seemed to work. The shark veered slightly away, confused by the noise. Stella seized her chance, kicking upwards with every ounce of remaining strength. 
She broke through to the surface, gasping for breath. Strong arms hauled her into the boat moments before the shark lunged again, missing her by inches. The crew erupted in cheers as she collapsed onto the deck, sobs of relief mixing with her ragged coughs. Anya checked Stella for injuries, her stern face finally softening with a hint of a smile. The bite wound on her shoulder was shallow, but the mental scars would take longer to heal. The image of the shark's cold, blank eyes would haunt Stella's nightmares for weeks, months, perhaps even years to come. The rest of the journey back to shore was a blur. She sat trembling, a blanket wrapped ineffectually around her shivering form. Somehow, miraculously, she had survived. Back on land, the world felt impossibly bright and loud. The ocean would always hold a strange allure for her. Yet her near-death experience had etched into her a healthy dose of respect, even fear. Diving would always be a part of her life, but from now on she would navigate the depths with hard-won knowledge. She was not the master of this domain, merely a visitor at the mercy of its unpredictable inhabitants. Jackson Walker had always been a city boy. He thrived amidst the concrete and the crowds, finding a strange energy within the urban sprawl. Numbers were his forte, calculations his comfort zone. A successful financial analyst, his life followed a carefully crafted plan. Measured risks, steady routines, and predictable outcomes. He was a man who built his world with spreadsheets and stock market trends, not ocean currents and coral reefs. But Sarah, his relentlessly cheerful girlfriend, was a force of nature he couldn't quite quantify. She craved open spaces and unexpected turns. Her proposal of a getaway to the Turks in Caicos Islands was less a suggestion more a vibrant exclamation point on their meticulously ordered calendar. It was the 22nd of September, 2010, his first full day in this Caribbean paradise, and he was already questioning every decision that led him to this moment. This morning he bobbed awkwardly in water so clear he could see straight to the vibrant coral below. Snorkeling had been Sarah's idea, a relaxing way to enjoy the marine life. Yet with water lapping at his ears and an uncomfortable plastic tube in his mouth, relaxation felt out of reach. The nagging tickle of fear in the back of his mind wouldn't subside. Out here, he was out of his depth, literally and figuratively. The reef teemed with life so colorful it seemed unreal. Schools of fish darted around him in shimmering clouds, utterly unfazed by his presence. The sunlight filtering down felt deceptively warm, masking the undercurrent of chilly water. Yet the beauty outweighed the discomfort, at least for now. The other tourists seemed at ease in the water, laughing and pointing out unusual creatures to each other. Jackson felt a pang of envy mixed with self-judgment. Sarah would have been entirely in her element here. He imagined her graceful figure cutting through the water, her laughter echoing off the distant cliffs. Yet he was the type to analyze risks, calculate odds, and hedge his bets. This spontaneous foray into the ocean felt like the opposite of control. Mako sharks were known to cruise the deep waters around these islands. Sleek and swift, they were the cheetahs of the sea built for speed and power. Jackson was well aware of their presence, even as he told himself the chances of an attack were slim. His guide, a seasoned local named Theo, reassured him of their safety measures. Still, a nagging feeling of unease persisted. Sarah would have labeled it wrong intuition. He preferred to call it risk assessment. Beneath the surface, a large shape detached itself from the gloom below the reef. It moved with deceptive speed, streamlined and powerful. Jackson's breath hitched in his snorkel. Theo was nowhere to be seen. His heart pounded a frantic rhythm. It was too big to be a harmless reef shark, and its silhouette was unmistakable. A mako. And it was heading straight for him. Time warped around Jackson. The world narrowed down to him, the panicked beating of his heart and the impossibly fast approach of the shark. His clumsy, snorkeling movements were no match for the predator's efficient glide. The mako closed the distance in a blink, its jaws opened in a grotesque display of needle-like teeth. In that split second, everything Jackson thought he knew about the world shattered. Out here, spreadsheets and logic meant nothing. He was prey, plain and simple. Survival instinct took over. He kicked frantically, adrenaline masking the icy shock of the water. His lungs screamed at him to surface to signal for help, but the Mako was relentless in its pursuit. He had read about playing dead if confronted by a bear, but could the same trick fool a shark? 
Desperation drove him to try. He went limp, his arms floating at his sides, hoping the lack of struggle would fool the predator. The Mako circled him closely, its eye a chilling black marble. Then, to his utter horror, it rammed him hard, knocking him violently through the water. It was only a warning, the actual attack was yet to come. He surfaced, choking on a mixture of seawater and terror. He thrashed wildly, screaming for help that seemed agonizingly far away. His rational mind knew that frantic movements could attract the shark, but reason lost its hold in this fight for life. Suddenly, he spotted Sarah. She was snorkeling a distance away, blissfully unaware of the danger approaching her. His voice cracked into a strangled yell, a desperate bid to warn her. The Mako, however, had found a new target. Jackson watched helplessly as the shark surged towards his girlfriend. The time he stretched agonizingly slow. He tried swimming towards her, his clumsy strokes pitifully ineffective against the shark's power. Sarah saw it at the last moment, her carefree expression replaced with stark terror. Suddenly Theo appeared from nowhere, wielding a long spear. With practiced precision, he thrust it towards the Mako, forcing the predator to veer away from Sarah. Sarah scrambled onto a patch of exposed coral, sobs catching in her throat. Jackson's focus snapped back to his desperate situation. Theo was a skilled spear fisherman, but one man against a Mako shark was a dangerous gamble. He swam towards them, his body screaming with exhaustion. He needed to get out of the water even if it meant leaving Theo behind. He was about to yell this cowardly thought when he saw it. Blood bloomed in the water around Theo. The shark, angered by the spear, had come back for vengeance. A thrashing form was barely visible amidst the crimson cloud. He could do nothing but watch in horror as a man who had been a comforting presence minutes ago was now lost in a frenzy of teeth and churning water. Suddenly the boat appeared, alerted by his earlier shouts and the ensuing chaos. Strong hands gripped him, hauling his waterlogged body over the railing to safety. He collapsed onto the deck, sobs of terror and relief escaping him. As they sped back to shore, he caught a glimpse of the retreating Mako, its silhouette a dark smudge against the azure water. Sarah clung to him, her cries muffled against his chest. In the aftermath, there was the hurried treatment for his minor cuts and bruises, the questioning by concerned officials, and the numb shock wearing off into bone-deep terror. None of that felt real compared to the sight of the empty water where Theo once was. Once a source of vibrant beauty, the ocean was now tainted with the crimson hue of violence. He knew he was lucky to be alive. His vacation, his old life, felt like a distant memory, shattered by a predator's cold, calculating eyes. It would take time and probably a lot of therapy before he could even look at photos of water, let alone venture into it again. The Mako shark had not just claimed a victim. It had stolen a piece of Jackson's spirit, leaving a deep, jagged wound that might never truly heal. 